<clears throat> All right, everyone, welcome to another webinar with eAssist Dental Solutions. We are really excited to be here with you guys today. Um, you'll see our fabulous panel here at the top of your screen. So I just have a few housekeeping notes for you before we get started. First off, all the slides and the recording of this webinar will be provided to you as soon as this webinar is done, usually before Tuesday, we'll get that sent out to you by email. So you'll see that come into your inbox. So feel free to take notes and everything, but don't worry, we will make sure you've got these slides in your inbox. And of course, if you have any questions, you'll see a little Q&A bubble at the bottom of your screen. You can drop questions in there and we'll leave time at the end of the program to answer as many questions as possible. And of course, in the chat bubble there, you can change your chat bubble to message all attendees and have a conversation as a community here so that we as a team and as a group can continue to learn and grow together. So that being said, I'm going to let you take it away, <clears throat> Dr. Anderson. Thanks, Sarah. I really appreciate it. Uh, we are grateful for the, the hour and a half you've set apart to talk to us. And like what Sarah said, we will, be interact we will hope that we learn from each other today. We, we hope that you interact, that uh, there's, a, there's 12 slides. We actually want your opinion so that we can learn from each other as dentists. But this is, let's review what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna first review what we discussed in our first seminar, a, a webinar about mining your margins, achieving a 49% overhead. We'll also talk about the theory of operational bottlenecks and how you resolve them. But what the most important bottleneck is in a dental practice and best practices for eliminating bottlenecks in 12 operational areas of focus that we have at our dental offices. Who are we? Just very quickly, for those of you that haven't participated before, I'm Dr. Anderson. I'm a dentist, started ESIS, started nine dental practices. You can see my credentials there. Great, grateful that you've, grateful to be a part of this. Taylor. I'm Taylor Anderson. Pleasure to be on the panel today. A business attorney, been practicing about 17 years. Uh, been a partner at several uh, Salt Lake City area law firms and joined eAssist about a year and a half ago. Great, thanks. Brian. I'm, I'm Dr. Brian Borg, uh, just a, a practicing dentist. I've had uh, several offices, opened them up, and uh, currently just a, a, dental, a dentist like everyone else on here. Dr. Willis. All right, yeah, I'm Dr. Willis. I, uh, Practiced uh, for about 18 years. James and I went to school together 18 years ago. Sure did. Fun times. You started 12 dental practices. They've all been scratch practices too. And Warren was always ahead of me in the, in the class. So we're glad, we're glad <laughs> to have you on. Well, who we are, eAssist is America's number one dental billing service provider. We have over 800, I think it's 900 now plus members strong. And we serve thousands of dental offices nationwide. Our purpose is to deliver peace of mind. That's why we exist. And as an organization, we're giving these webinars for free to deliver as much peace of mind as we possibly can to help dentists be more successful at practicing dentistry. Taylor, there's some legalese here though. Will you please explain? Sure, Den we're dentists helping dentists. Um, we're not giving any tax, legal or investment advice. Uh, you know, Laws, materials are subject to change. We're not covering every detail, of course. Uh, of course, each of you should independently confirm you know, with your own professional advisors what's appropriate in your circumstances. That said, we're really excited to share with you uh, what we've applied uh, or learned over the years. Thanks, Taylor, I appreciate that. So let's review what we discussed in our last webinar, Mining the Margins Part One. Uh, Warren, just to set the stage here so we know what we're talking about, we're gonna drive to 49% overhead, but would you just explain what the definition of overhead is from your point of view here? Yeah, basically it's just every cost that's not associated with pay that we're paying a dentist, whether that's yourself or an associate. So if we look at all the funds that it takes to run a dental office besides the individual compensation to any dentist, that's what we're calling overhead. Okay, with that understood, most what we've learned from materials, and you can see the source here, that most dental practices run at a 75% overhead. You can see they're claiming the specialties are 74.9. I'm not sure I believe that. Uh, your practices are probably somewhere in between 50 and 75% or 60 and 75%. Uh, what, what, what our colleagues, what, the, what most uh, consultants will recommend is that you shoot for 59% overhead at a dental, as a dental, general dentist. Uh, if you're a specialist, you can see what you're shooting for, but we're focusing on general dentistry here. 59% overhead, which doesn't include your salary. And the way they get to that is by breaking the individual categories into four. All of your expenses should 
should fall into four different categories. And if you shoot for these percentages, you'll hit 59% overhead. What we're saying is different. Just like how the four minute mile, when it, it, was, it was unheard of, and as soon as it was broken, all of a sudden everyone runs four minute, four minute. We believe the new four minute mile is 49% overhead. And this is how you get here. You can see the numbers there. This is a review of Mind the Margins Part One. We hope you take a look at it. But this is what we're trying to drive to. So in our last, in our last uh, webinar, we talked about opportunity cost. And so it's important that you understand this principle. What is an opportunity cost? Because we, we're, we introduced a new term called hourly opportunity cost or your hourly overhead rate. It's important you start thinking like this in order for you to drive your margins to 49% because every little decision you make is incredibly important. You have to know what each hour costs you if you decide to close the office down. The easiest way to, to think about opportunity costs is a vacation. If you're gonna take your family on a vacation for a week, you know that the vacation costs more than just $5,000 to go wherever to Disneyland or whatever when they open up again and, uh, <laughs> and, and, do a, and, and pay for the vacation in the hotel. You also know that you're shutting your office down for an entire week and you might produce 35,000, 40,000, whatever you're producing in a week. That is also the expense of your vacation. So your vacation isn't just a $5,000 vacation, it's a $35,000 vacation. That's a real cost, an opportunity cost. And it's important that you break that down into hourly opportunity costs so that you can actually make intelligent decisions on whether or not you should shut the office down if you should, if you should close early. The way you do it is you, Rowan, would you mind explaining uh, you how, how you calculate your hourly overhead rate or your hourly opportunity right. cost? So we already just talked about what we're defining as overhead expenses. It's everything outside of the dental income. And so now we're gonna calculate your rent, your supplies, your lab bills, you know, all that's included, you know, your lab and all those expenses. And then we're gonna figure out the number of hours the office is open in a month. And we're gonna divide the expenses by the number of hours we're open. And now we know exactly what it costs us every hour we're open, have the doors open. So if somebody's coming for a free appointment for an hour, you know that you're not making anything, you're just talking and chatting, it's still costing you whatever this figure is. Sit there and talk to them. It's important that you all know that. This was, a, this was like the, the challenge of our last webinar was, do you know, go calculate your hourly opportunity cost or your hourly rate. Uh, what, and we'd like to do a poll. Uh, Brian? Yeah. Sarah? So this poll is, uh, like James was saying, we, we went over this last time and we want to know how many of you know your hourly uh, opportunity cost. So Sarah, will you pull, pull up the, um, the poll? This is great. We love these polls uh, because it gives us an idea of, you know, where everybody is and everybody can see this. We'll go over the numbers after. Uh, so if you can answer that to, uh, do, do we want to, what if they don't know their, their hourly rate? We want to, yeah, we probably should have had another one that said, I don't know it yet. And it's all right. Can go back just one slide, Dr. Anderson. We can show the uh, calculations and they could do it in real time. Yeah, okay. I'll go back one slide. <laughs> but we got people coming in right now. We've got about 18% of the folks on the call who have gone ahead and inputted. I guess if you don't know, you could certainly just go ahead and make your educated guess here and we can always sure up these numbers but if you are on part one you probably already calculated this number with us on the last version of this webinar and now on part two we just want to make sure it stays top of mind for you right it's a, it's a really important number uh i know that after our uh webinar last time i calculated mine and i put it up in my office and it's they're looking at me at all times so i know that when i shut my office down that that, that cost me no this is this is an important concept because let's go ahead and close the poll and end uh we just wanted to make sure that that you you did it that you didn't bypass this step and think it wasn't important it's really important and I love Brian, less than 300 percent or 300 dollars or 21 percent. that's great yeah i love what you said brian that you actually have it up hanging in your wall in your office so that everybody can see it your staff knows how expensive it is to take an hour or two off oh, my, my patients don't see it but it's in a place <laughs> where we all see it right it's critical we won't spend more time there but warren you had an example of 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 how to actually use this number with your staff. Right. Yeah, so I work at, I only work at one practice and around two days a week now, but I know at that practice, it's $350. I mean, it's like 349 
to be exact, but it's $350 an hour. And so if the staff says, hey, Dr. Willis, can we, uh, you know, have an extra hour for lunch? We want to go out and, and do this or that. Um, I know that's going to cost $350, not just the price of lunch, $350 on top of lunch. So, you know, you could offer to give everybody a gift card and, you know, stay in and order pizza and you'd be far ahead. So it's Libby. important to know that number. It's important. All right. Well, so we had some that were over 600. That's wonderful. And most, a good 25% were between 300 and 400. Just remember that you're buying time when you understand this principle. If you want to take Fridays off, if you understand what your cost per hour overhead is or what your opportunity cost is, and you don't want to make any more money, you do all these things we're discussing. We talked about negotiating last time and today we're talking about bottlenecks. But if you do all these things and drive your your dollar per hour down, so you make more, your opportunity cost is even higher. You uh, you know that that your Friday, you actually can buy some time, buy an extra day. If the more you save on money, of course, the more, uh, less you have to work to make the same amount of money, you know that, no big deal. So understand, self-explanatory. So we also talked about the big five, we called it. Here they are. Don't be afraid to negotiate everything. We talked about that last time. We're gonna review it very quickly. Eliminate op operational bottlenecks, el implement best practices for streamlining and efficiency. We're going to be talking about those two concepts today. And we want your help too, to help us learn from one another. Spend and then and the next, our next webinar will be talking about spending money to make money and collecting 100% of what is rightfully owed to you. All right. So we discussed not, not uh, about negotiation. Don't be afraid to negotiate. Uh, and we used, introduced some terms that you may not have been familiar with. If these terms are still new to you, please go back and watch our previous webinar. You've got to understand what your BATNA is when you go into any negotiation. You have to be sure to map out your negotiation space. You have to make sure you negotiate the collective. And we even used the Dr. Borg <laughs> and the collective for the Star Trek fans. you got to make sure when you go to negotiate, never negotiate line by line by line by line by line. Never. It's a complete package, a complete deal. And that's how you get and drive the best value for both parties. You also, we introduced a term called ZOPA. If you understand these terms, understand these concepts, you will negotiate without fear. You'll, you'll have so much confidence and you'll, and you'll negotiate a win-win and you won't come across as a jerk and your relationship will be saved and it'll be strengthened. Another important principle is to anchor. We talked more about how, how important it is to scientifically have proven that the person that offers the first offer, it's very difficult to move substantially away from that offer unless the offer was so outrageous that the other party didn't let the other party anchor them to that, to that range. We then focused on these 12 areas where you should negotiate every aspect of your practice. Remember, this is an important part of getting to an overhead of 49%, the new four minute mile. You have to spend time in each of these various areas and we hope you have. If you haven't yet, go back and watch the presentation. You still have some homework. You're never <laughs> going to reach 49% unless you do, unless you do uh, this, this kind of heavy lifting. But we have some good news for you. In the spirit of negotiation and nego uh, uh, buying power, Warren, tell us what you've got going on. Yeah, so basically, you know, we've been leveraging the uh, nearly 1,400 clients that belong to eAssist and been working with national manufacturers and as of right now we're finalizing the legal terms uh, but we have an offer in, in place to us with a, a national supplier who is going to be able to bring us great value deep discounts and offer tremendous solutions for your practices to become even more profitable and uh, it's going to be a fantastic thing what as soon as we can uh, share the details. So it is coming soon. Be, be, stay tuned. It's an example of negotiating and ensuring that uh, we're driving a win-win relationship with everyone that we interact with. And thank, we're looking forward to announcing that in more detail. It's a great win for everybody. So go do it for your practice. Go negotiate all those 12 various areas. It's a huge step forward. All right, today we're going to be talking about eliminating operational bottlenecks, like I said, and, and how to Im improve our... Now we've We've combined these together because they're very, very similar. You've got to understand the theory of an operational bottleneck and your solutions will always improve these efficiencies to eliminate bottlenecks. So they go hand in hand and we're going to first talk about what an operational bottleneck is. You can read the, the description there, the, the academic didactic description of a bottleneck. I, let me just explain it very simply that 
every system will have a bottleneck. Every system will. There'll always be some inhibiting factor where the workflow or the process is limited by one person, either a person or a machine or a, a process. Something slows it down. It's usually, it's usually something that um, isn't obvious. It's usually often the wrong thing that's slowing something down. And bottlenecks can appear in, a ver in, in every area of, a, of an operation, of a small business, of, of manufacturing anything and serving anyone in any industry. But Warren, you had an insight just from a dentist point of view in simple terms. Yeah, I, I, I feel like, uh, you know, just in simple terms, it's basically reflected in missed opportunities within our pr practice. We're, not, we're missing opportunities to grow or poor systems that, you know, we're just not handling um, things correctly as far as getting patients in, treatment plans accepted and so forth. So it's bad systems or missed growth opportunities are really the, where I look at bottlenecks in a practice. I think a unique, a unique understanding too is this last sentence here that sometimes when you have low employee morale problems and you have customers that perhaps are upset or patients that are upset, <clears throat> sometimes it's because you have bottlenecks that need to be resolved. It's not the only cause of these things, but it can be a source of it. So let's talk about a first time I was introduced to operational bottlenecks. I was a business student at the Y at the Marriott School of Management, and we had to take a little team of five guys and we we, we spent a few hours next to a few different restaurants and counted the number of cars that came through per hour. You know, sometimes you drive by a Wendy's window and you see that, you see the sign that says, please pull, pull forward. Somebody spent so much time to design this system to have two different windows to eliminate operational bottlenecks, but the owners of the, of the Wendy's uh, aren't using it or utilizing it. Uh, but often when you go to McDonald's, they always have both windows in operation. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. Not only when we count the number of cars, and if you ever have something you want to do on a date or something with a kid, uh, just, just for fun, it's not. <laughs> just go and take a notepad and count the number of cars yourself. You will find that not only when they break out this bottleneck when it comes to taking the food and having the customer find their credit card or get the cash and then giving it to the cashier and then getting the food to the person after it's been put in the system or the credit card has been processed. All of that takes time. And if it's the same person doing it, they can't see nearly as many cars or they can't service nearly as many customers per hour. But by breaking it up and recognizing that that is a bottleneck right now, we could actually service more. We got a bunch of hamburgers all lined up, but we can't get it out the door because we're waiting for the customer to pay us the bill or we're waiting for the customer to order. Uh, before they even had you know, these kinds of things where you ordered away, you'd order at the window. So there's these systems have been put in place by other industries to demonstrate the fact that operational bottlenecks are real and you should be, they're all around us and solutions to them are all around us. So by having two different windows, not only did the number of cars they could service, like I said, it didn't just double, it was a lot higher than that. I can't remember the exact number, but it wasn't just twice as much. It was even more. So it makes a, a huge difference. And now whenever you drive by any restaurant, I hope in your mind, when you see they ha aren't using a second window, that you recognize that's an operational error that is a bottleneck and an inefficiency, they're never going to get busier if they're inefficient. The more efficient you are, the more you open the flow, the more hours you open in your office, the more hours you're open. I just have a real life example where I opened a dental practice and we had it closed down for two days. It was only open two days a week for a year and a half. And then we, I changed some things and we got a new dentist and a new partner and we opened up five days a week. And in one month, in two months during COVID, we just had our very best month. We just doubled it because we're open, but it's intuitive to, it's counterintuitive to think, well, I got to hire another employee. I got to have another spot. Is it really going to work? Do I have to trust it? You do. You have to trust it that by eliminating bottlenecks, efficiencies always are created. And those efficiencies are recognized by customers and they reward you with more business, but it's, it's like a catch 22. It's a leap of faith. Am I really going to get more business by having someone stacked at this window? Well, Chick-fil-A's figured it out. Not only do they get more business and they have blown the model up. It's operational transparency. Our operational efficiencies eliminating bottlenecks on steroids. 
They don't only have just one window. They have four or five or six guys with iPads <laughs> collecting your order, knowing that that is the biggest bottleneck. And the more efficient customers want their food and they want it fast. And so the more fast we can deliver the food, the more customers we're going to get. It costs more money to staff it. But if it's a good system, customers will reward us with, with more business. That's the theory behind it. And Chick-fil-A and Wendy's and McDonald's, I think, is a great example. And I hope you never forget it. Any comments, Brian, uh, Warren? Well, you know, my only thought on all that, we had a little discussion about this before, where the bottleneck is. And, and I kind of argued, well, sometimes I go to those things and, and the, the window, I, yeah, I pay my money, but then I get to the next spot and I have to sit there and wait anyways. And that's just because the bottleneck is somewhere else in the, in the restaurant. They right. fix their, their collecting of the money problem. But, so there's always bottlenecks. Uh, but you're right, Chick-fil-A, boy, they sure have figured that out, haven't they? And, and if you have all those people collecting money, I think In-N-Out does it too. If you have all those people collecting money, but you're not getting the cheese or the chicken stuff right and the nuggets cooked well, yeah, you don't, then you've got a bottleneck somewhere you got else. a bottleneck over there. But you don't want to eliminate, create one bottleneck just because you have a problem over here. You have to ensure that you focus on all your bottlenecks. And so we have gone through a typical dental practice. All our dental practices, I've started nine, Warren's 12, Brian three. And we think about where are our bottlenecks? And we've organized them into 12 different areas. And if any one of these has a problem, you're going to have a stoppage of work in that area. And it's going to affect all the other systems. Here they are. You can read them. And we're going to go through them one by one. And we hope that you help us all together. We hope we synergize to come up with solutions to all of these various bottlenecks in a minute. But we have a poll for you now. Brian, take it away. James, can you go back one slide? I'm just yeah. going to have everyone look at that. Because the poll is uh, what we want to identify is where our listeners and where people are on the webinar, where they think their biggest concern or their biggest bottleneck in their practice is. And it's going to be different for each one. So we have them listed out here. You can look at, this, look at the screen there. Take a minute. Think about your office. Think about where you get uh, slowed. The flow of your practice gets slowed the most and just select one and uh we would like to see what the results are let's have and it, and it changes from week to week i get that but but pick the one that you, you think is the you know the most problematic in your office this is so important and every office may be a little bit different but just pick one and it's important that we all vote on this everybody on the call right now please vote there this is there's an incredible aha moment here and we we really need to see where everybody is and and some of them need a little bit of explanation but that but i think you can figure it out uh james warren brian i'd be interested to know what what your answer is for your practices <laughs> uh, it, like i said it's different every time right now that's a great a the question for me because i'm actually experiencing a, a bottleneck in one of my offices and i have been fighting it for two or three years and it is an operatory I, I, I need another operatory. I actually went out and hired another dentist. I went out and hired other people, but I haven't been able to increase my production quite enough. So I have two, I have two things that I have to do. I either have to extend my hours to open up operatories or add an operatory. So right now it's an operatory. Right. I had that same problem, Brian. I think we discussed this and uh, uh, we ended up pulling out the personal office or the dentist in yeah. the, the practice and the same thing, yeah. and now there's no personal office but there's an extra operatory in the office and uh it's making money <laughs> that's the way of describing the uh creative solutions we have to do sometimes to solve these problems and i'll answer my mine are my dentists that is where my bottleneck is well you're we, good let's close this pull out and and uh explain so we have 13 percent of you or 31 percent treatment plans and present treatment plan presentations Another 24%, a quarter of you in assistance and hygiene and front office staff. Uh, another 12% in scheduling and call handling. And 14% are dentists, 10% patients. Yep. All right. Well, this is what we anticipated, isn't it, guys? And yes. here is the aha moment. Let, well, let's see before we go there in the chat box. What do you think the theory is here? Which of these areas should be the number one bottleneck? What should it be? Just put in the chat box. Let's just kind of guess here. What do you think? Now you know what it is, what yours are. And thank you for participating. But what do you think it should be? Every system has to have a bottleneck. You'll always have somewhere where it slows down. 
if you're going to get a 49% profit margin or 49% overhead, how are, where does your bottleneck need to continually be? All right. Here's the theory they teach in business school. You always want your highest dollar per hour person or system or piece of equipment. Think of someone who has a million dollar piece of equipment here. You always want that to be the bottleneck. Some of you might want to change your answers in the chat, <laughs> right? Think about it. If you owned a factory, where's your bottleneck? Is it your receptionist bringing the orders in or is it your $3 million piece of equipment that takes 60 seconds to make the, the, the widget? You want the bottleneck to be in your $3 million piece of equipment because all the rest of it is a lot cheaper. So the point is that your dentist, you are your highest dollar per hour person in the dental practice. We have to always be the bottleneck. And this, this, this should give you great comfort because all of you that voted that your dentist, that you're not the bottleneck, that it's other things, it means you can really drive a lot of efficiencies mm -hmm. to solve a lot of problems to drive down your expenses, to get your overhead down to 49%. Uh, you know, I, I think, and those of you that, the 15% that have dentistry, 14% that already have the dentists, in our next presentation, we're gonna talk about, in, in our final version of, of this of series, we're actually talking about how you overcome that bottleneck. Uh, so James, you, yeah. when, when my assistants come to me and say, we're always waiting on you, Dr. Borg, is it that's then that's a good thing, right? We're in a good spot. <laughs> There's not enough of you, Brian. There's not enough of me, well, then it's good. Only if you're doing procedures. If you're do, if you're on the internet, if I'm, if I'm on the, okay. <laughs> I see. I get you. Then you got to overcome that bottleneck. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Bring in an associate. You, you know me too well, then. I know. <laughs> uh, so, but this is the point we want to make: is that it, it that that it's dentistry is unique. We usually. A lot of people look up to us. Our staff looks up to us. We're their boss. We're the HR team, and we're the and and we're the person, the operator, doing all the work that they're work, working alongside. And so often, as dentists, we don't let our teams solve problems with us. But it's more of a they come to you, and you, we kind of train them this way too. They come to us, and they say there's a problem, and then we say, well, this is how you fix it. R Warren, have you ever done anything like that, or do you do it differently? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. You know, we are problem solvers naturally, right? Tell me what's broken. I know how to fix it. And so it really is uh, a lesson to learn to say, okay, uh, you know, I don't know as much about you and sterilization or what's happening up front with insurance and why insurance is taking so long to get a hold of, you know, we need to ask them for their input for sure. That's the point we want to make here is that your team can solve these problems. The, the, the Chinese word, the Japanese word, the Toyota people talk about this in some of the, and I'll, I'll talk about a book that they recommend you read about Toyota and how they did some things to solve all their operational issues. But what, what they talk about is being in the gimba. Those that are at the gimba or the job site, the people actually answering the phones and being at the front desk, as long as their incentives are aligned properly, we'll discuss that in our next webinar about bonus systems too and how important that is. As long as they're, and as long as their incentives are aligned properly, they and they are and they understand the idea of bottlenecks and they understand the principles that we're trying to teach here today, they will help you solve those problems. And they will want to help, they'll feel more important. Everyone wants to be important. And by putting by delegating responsibility to them to help you solve the problems, you'll be surprised the kind of teamwork that is created. And I love this quote. You can read it. You probably already have. It's important to believe in others and link up with others. So the theory of, now that we understand operational bottlenecks, the theory behind solving all of our bottlenecks, and we have the 12, we're gonna go into each 12 of them here in a minute, but they can be summarized with these four points, or these five points. We're gonna talk about these in more detail, but you can read them. Delegation is include, delegation and, and division of labor is how you multiply the high performers. Automating with technology, so many of you, so many of us use Weave and other thing, other sources, uh, Solutions Reach, other technologies. Uh, of course, our, our practice management software, just texting, texting out is we're using automation to help us uh, communicate with our customers, our, with our patients. We'll talk about standardized workflow, how important that is, and then measuring with KPIs and what those are in a minute. But Brian, do you have any questions or comments about these, the theory behind? No, I mean, I, I just think it's interesting. I mean, each one of those can be applied to any business, right? Um, 
And, and the measuring KPIs, that, that one really stands out to me because I have a hard time doing that sometimes. Uh, how, do you, how do you measure a bottleneck? And, uh, you know, we've talked about uh, building some software for that because it's, it's been one of the things that we're trying to, to do and in our individual office. So, but it's very important to do so that you can see where the bottlenecks are. Yeah. For those of you that aren't familiar with the term KPI, it stands for Key Performance Indicator. It means measuring a number. We'll talk about that in a minute. Here's the golden rule about delegation that I just love. I think John Maxwell taught this in leadership that you want to delegate anything away, everything you possibly can, as long as that person can do it 80% as well as you can. If they can't, you got to train them until they can hit the 80% mark. And once you hit that point, don't be afraid to let go. That's how you build leaders. That's how you build other in individuals. That's how you eliminate morale problems. People feel more important because they feel like you trust them and they have an important job to do because you delegated it to them. I love this principle. It's a sound concept. We hope you practice it. The goal here is that you work yourself out of a job. And if you can teach your staff the same concept, because so many of them through modeling, you doing it for them, they'll do it for others. So many of our front office staff don't want to teach anyone anything they know because they're worried about their own job security and they don't understand the concept that the person who can build other leaders is so valuable to any organization, their job is the most secure. Right, Warren? Yeah, for sure. Do you Absolutely. have any office managers like that that, you know, that go? I, always tell, I, I even tell my brother in the practice that we own together, I'm like, I'll replace you before I replace the office manager. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to make sure we de uh, develop that culture in the office. So let's talk about, that's the uh, active delegation. You've got to learn how to do it. You've got to teach others how to do it. So let's talk about standardized workflow. What, what is this? Well, I think the first time I experienced this, I had been a dentist for three years and I had started my first practice and I felt like every three months in our staff meetings, we were talking about the same thing that we already talked about three months ago. We came up with a solution. We instituted the solution three months ago. We solved the problem three months ago, but I never talked about it again in another staff meeting for three more months. And because I wasn't talking about it, it went away. And we had it right back to the exact same problem. And we it happens, didn't it happens make any all progress. the time. Oh, I, I was there. I could validate it. It's, it's, it's true the story. worst. <laughs> every to everybody. Well, I warn you've had this happen to you in your practice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You're like, I explained this. We don't do it like that. <laughs> well, you didn't talk about it. I thought we could go back to the old way. And that's the thing. Where do you get the wedge? Is the wedge you always have to talk about it over and over again, or is there a different way? Look at the graph here. You can see this is what Toyota gave the world. The idea of standardized workflow, lean, lean, uh, and the Six Sigma. Here's the concept of lean manufacturing that once you come up with a solution to solve a problem, you need to find a way to standardize that workflow so you never roll the bowler backwards again. You're always making progress up the hill. You're always improving. So it's a little bit more work up front, James, to standardize it. Like you, you have to put some sort of a protocol or a system or I know that you guys use a lot of Google Docs and things like that to keep track of it. It's a little work up front, but man, if you put it in, it pays so, many, so much dividends down the road. You don't have to revisit it. Right. One example of this, James, just personal example that I had to go through the other day was I told him, if we ever change anything in the chair, you're going to use this particular system to make sure the front office knows when they check them out that we added a procedure. You know, so the, those procedures, those extra procedures we do get billed and they are, don't end up because if we check them out and we didn't bill it, it's going to be free. I'm not going to have to have this conversation with them about they owe us more money. Right. So, you know, and because it wasn't as standardized as we should have done it, it happened again. So that's a great example, Warren. Now, this is a theory behind how you solve your own bottlenecks. We're gonna review the 12 different categories of bottlenecks here. We're gonna help each other solve different bottlenecks, but you have unique problems because of your staff, the way they think, because of your culture that you've created, because of you and the way you think. All of that's gonna be unique and you're gonna to have to solve your own bottlenecks. We'll share with you how we've solved ours and, and we'll, we'll ask for pe people's comments in the chat box of how we've all solved various bottlenecks. 
I hope we can learn from all each other, from each other. I know we will. But you've got to understand that these are theories that if you apply to all of your bottlenecks, you will solve them all. And it's your responsibility as the leader of the ship to solve them all, help the team see the vision. Standardizing the workflow is incredibly important. And the way we did it is I just asked the very best person who was my very best assistant, what do you do every day? What do you do every week? What do you do every month? What do you do every quarter? Because there are times where she cleans the traps out. I, I think the first time I figured it out was after six months, we had never cleaned the, cleaned the traps and all of a sudden our vacuum system went down. I'd been open for six months and I was like, what's going on? And then uh, Henry Schein came out or someone came out and said, well, you're supposed to clean these traps every six months. And I was like, what? I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was part of someone's duties. I just didn't have the right people that were doing it. But when you bring in people that already have those skill sets or the, 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 that idea from another dental practice, you're inheriting other people's standardization. And that's not a good thing. You've got to make sure as a team, you standardize your workflow. And to me, it's writing it down. We created a series of Google Docs that, and Google Reports. And everybody, every day, has to click on the Google Report. Whenever we're struggling with a bottlenecks, this is what we do. We go back to it. When it's understood and it's ingrained in people's heads, we don't have to worry about it. But when it's not, we have a Google Doc, a Google report, they click on it, they read it every single day, and they're hearing, one of them even said, Savannah told me, it's like I hear your voice in my head, Dr. Anderson, every <laughs> single day. So I don't have to repeat it. So our meetings, our staff meetings, weren't repeating the same thing over and over and over again. They were repeating something new. We were talking about new creative solutions. We were like building relationships more because we weren't just solving the same problem we solved six months ago. That's the power of standardized work. Figuring out how you standardize your work is important for you to figure out. Uh, and when you do, you'll see the, the, the boulders rolling up the hill, not always in the same spot. All right. What does it mean to measure with a KPI? Uh, Warren, what kind of KPIs are you measuring? Well, uh, in some of our practices, we have a bonus system. We'll talk more about it la later uh, on the next webinar. But we measure how many hy possible hygiene appointments there are in a month and how many of those were filled. So mm -hmm. how many... How many did we fill out of the total possible hygiene appointments? That would be considered a leading indicator. So the best book I've, I've found on figuring out your own indicators, your own KPIs, is this one, The Four Disciplines of Execution. It's an, I think it's like a five-hour audible listen. You can listen to it going back and forth to the office or exercising or something. And, or you can jump to the chapter about KPIs. But it's really important. They taught this principle so well that there really are two different types of KPIs. You've got leading indicators, things that you hope will solve problems. If you measure those leading indicators, then you hope that you get a stronger lagging indicator. And a good example of a lagging, a lagging indicator, there's two main ones in a dental office, or what? Collection and collection. Yeah. What is my production? What is my collections? We often set that as our goals. Every single goal, every day, we want our collections to be this and our production to be that. Or we set it monthly. Our, we want our production to be 150 and our collections to be 150 or whatever. But the leading indicator idea is what are things you can do to help drive that lagging indicator, to help drive production? Well, Warren, what you just said is a great example of that. If we can focus on the number of hygiene appointments based on our availability that are actually utilized and increase that number to 90% or 95% and create some bonus systems around a leading indicator like that, that can't be fudged, it helps drive our lagging indicator, the production that we get. And so in this book, we hope, you we hope you listen to it. You'll find it very helpful. If you're struggling with picking what kind of KPIs you should measure, and, and remember that when you have a bottleneck problem, you got to have some KPIs around that bottleneck, one or two, to measure it somehow. And it's going to be uniquely yours. And this, these insights given by these authors will help you figure out what those KPIs are, help your team figure out what those KPIs are. Well, I know we've talked about hiring more people and ensuring that we, we have better systems in place and we bring on more people. But just remember that even if you bring in more people, if you don't have efficient systems, you're not going to be more efficient. You're actually going to have your, your costs are going to go up because you won't be producing anymore. And it, the idea that it takes money to make money, that's true. You need to hire more people to make money. That's true. But unless your systems are efficient and you end up producing more and collecting more with those extra people, then you're shooting yourself in the foot. You got to first focus on fixing the problem. Often when I had morale problems, people will come to me and say, oh, we're overworked. We need to hire more staff. And I'm scratching my head going, no, 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 we don't. What that means is we have a bottleneck problem. 
let's figure out why you're overworked. Do we need some new technology? Do we need like, like an isolite, for instance, is a good example of a, a, a way to eliminate an operational bottleneck around assistance. We'll talk about that in a minute. Do we need, do we need a, better, a better handoff system, a better workflow, better communication? There's a number of things we can focus on and we'll, we'll dive in deep, but just remember the principle. We don't always wanna hire more people. We wanna first fix our systems, but once the systems are good, then like Chick-fil-A, you wanna hire five or six guys with iPads <laughs> and have them walk around the crowd. Yeah, you got your credit card? Have a double lane. <laughs> double, <laughs> double lane, yeah. two chairs at once. So another important principle when you're des designing your own systems to solve your bottlenecks, you want to automate with technology. This is normal. This is intuitive. Of course, we're doing that. But, but it's important to remember that the why we're hiring these systems to solve these problems is because it's a way to delegate something away from a human being to a computer or to a piece of equipment. Uh, and then, of course, ensuring that we focus on division of labor, that you get people really good at one skill so that they're so good at it, that they're so efficient at it. Of course, you, you cross train around so that, so that they can back up and they can help and assist and they can be focused on a handful of things. But, but the more efficient we are, it's called division of labor, the more efficient we are, it increases proficiency and that increases and eliminates, helps eliminate uh, bottlenecks as long as everyone shows up to work. So let's now dive deep into our potential operational bottlenecks for all of these 12 categories. Category number one. What is this one, Warren? What is this one all about? So basically, we're talking about treatment plan, treatment plan presentation. You know, we're making sure that the plans are discussed. Like, um, have you ever had this happen before where someone's going to check out and they come back to you in the chair and say, they want to know what they need to do first, you know? And I'm like, oh, we just went through the treatment plan. How do they not understand what the first thing we were going to do is? So you know, that's causing a delay in time and getting people through out the front, out the door. So our treatment plan presentation and the process of scheduling that patient needs to be streamlined so that that's happening in the back. And then the terms and conditions of what those payments are, are simply what's happening up front. So we, you know, that's, that's a part of what we're gonna, we're gonna look at is the presentation, how they're getting scheduled, how are we giving estimates and collecting? So how does yours, how do your system work, Warren, in your 12 practices when it comes to, you didn't mention this is one of your bottlenecks, but they're a good, a high number, 25%, 30% said this is one of their bottlenecks. Right. What are, what are the kind of things you do with your staff to eliminate this as a bottleneck? So you alluded to uh, a few things there, but can, can you right. paint the whole picture? I'm a patient, I'm in the chair, you come in, what happens? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, we're going to go through with the patient at the very end, I'm going to present the treatment that they need, and we're going to discuss exactly what they need. They're going to ask me if there's any questions. We want to make sure it's clearly understood. And then I, in front of the assistant, is going to say, this is the most important thing that we do first. So this is our first appointment. So they clearly hear that communicated. There's no confusion with the patient. They're on the same page as me. This is the first thing that we're gonna treat. And so, um, you know, sometimes in, in some occasions, there might be someone that just can't say yes to anything until we talk about the finances and we can have somebody come back or, or, or uh, can come back and while they're in the chair and explain that quickly to them about finances. But most of the time, there's a reasonable understanding of what the cost is and they're gonna make that appointment right then while I'm in the room. And, and the success rate of making a, a patient scheduling is much higher. If I walk out of the room and now they're talking about the appointment, the success, the success rate of those appointment scheduling goes down quite a bit. So after, and you do it differently than I do, and this is the point we wanted to make here, in the chat box, if you can talk about, if this isn't one of your problems, and there are lots of dentists that are on that have this problem. Please write down what you do to ensure that this isn't one of your bottlenecks. So Warren, after someone gets the, after they schedule the appointment, they're walked up to the front. Does someone talk with them about that? The, the pay? They do. End they do. They say, okay, you're scheduled for here. And let me go through your insurance and tell you what your portion is and how much you're going to be uh, needing to pay for this. And so, that discussion happens quickly, right? This is how much is owed. 
they understand if they can pay for it and now now they're prepared for for that next appointment so. hmm. that's great and and this isn't and then they did, 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 your, did they review the whole thing if it's a larger treatment plan is it the same process or is it any different you know if there's questions they are uh, well adapt at talking. They understand. They do a beautiful job of, of re-emphasizing something if it needs to be done yeah. about what what I've recommended. Brian, is this a bottleneck in your practice? Well, it has been in the past. Interestingly, it, it is one of those. It's a very uh, you can see it physically in the office when you bring up a patient and you've got someone standing at the front desk and then someone standing and waiting for the front desk. It drives you crazy as a doctor. You just want to get those patients in and out. So physically, you can really see them when they're waiting up there. So I love what Warren has mentioned. You get most of it done in the back. Um, we do it slightly different. And this is one that I'm kind of proud of because my team actually kind of made some changes and said, we think it would be better if uh, the assistant did this part and you made sure that it was uh, you didn't leave the room until this, we crossed this line. And then the very last part the front desk will do. And it works good for our team and our office. And, and so it would be different for everybody. But it, the most important thing is, in my mind, is that your team recognizes it. They see when, it, when, it, when the flow isn't happening right and that they make the changes that are appropriate to make sure that we don't have that bottleneck. Yeah, great, great insight. I, the way we've done it, and it, you're proving the point of letting the team solve the problem, mm -hmm. uh, they often will want to and can do it better than we can. We can offer guidance and vision, of course, and help when they're stuck. But if you got the right teammates, it can be done. I, we, we, our flow normally is after we're done with the treatment plan, we have a little sheet, a piece of paper, because we had an issue where our bottleneck was, was that the assistant would sometimes put the wrong information in the computer. I said something else and she put something yeah. else in. And now the person goes and gets a second opinion that other people think that I'm a dishonest dentist. I'm not. My assistant just put the wrong thing in. Yeah. And so we, we had to put a system in place where to ensure from checks and balances and redundancy where we have a piece of paper, a routing slip. And on that, I write down everything. I talk to the patient and then I double check and the assistant's writing down on that routing slip, that piece of paper. On the back side, there's a little chart uh, that lists all the teeth numbers and what the hygienist said was recommended and what I'm saying is recommended and what the steps are and how much time it's going to take for each of the various procedures, especially the next one. And, and I, uh, we have that conversation where we, we, we uh, the, the assistant is listening to me and engaged with me. And then I'm treatment planning it with the patient. And I'm talking to the patient, but I'm also talking to the assistant at the exact same time. And the assistant is writing it down. And when we're done, the assistant, uh, I look at the assistant sheet and I double check to make sure she got it right. And if she got it wrong, I'll say, no, this is supposed to be an MOD or this is supposed to be a, a, a RCT on tooth number 12. And then, um, and this is step, this is number, then I make sure it's prioritized one, two, three, four. Yeah. Her responsibility is to, to quickly get that in the computer before the patient's leaving. Hopefully she's typed it in while I am presenting the treatment plan. That's the vision. So the patient doesn't have to wait for her to do some notes. That's a bottleneck now all of a sudden. So if she's listening to me, we have a computer in the operatory, she's typing it in, she writes it on the sheet, I double check it, it's all good, there weren't any mistakes made, she can quickly walk the patient up to our treatment plan coordinator, who then reviews the treatment, it's already, the insurance verification's already been verified, we know what it's gonna cost, that's, an, that's a fundamental part of presenting a treatment plan, and then you, uh, and then she says what the whole pocket's gonna, what, what the whole treatment's gonna be, and we encourage you to, uh, and, and we give you a discount if you prepay for the whole thing. We don't give people a discount to pay in cash because we always pay our taxes. That's just a way of, that's like code for we're not going to pay the IRS what we owe. Like we don't, there's nothing special about cash, but prepayment to me is a special thing. That means they're not going to no show. Yeah. So they're more likely to come because they already paid for it. And so we do that. We schedule the appointment and sometimes the treatment plan coordinator will schedule the appointment. If they're bottlenecked and there's someone waiting, then she walks into the front and the front person schedules the appointment. Uh, and the routing slip goes with them from person to person to person. So we know what the next step is supposed to be. And the person at the front verifies that the person in the back put in the right, system, the right uh, information in the chart. And the treatment plan coordinator is now working with the second person that was waiting. So there's still some bottlenecks there, but not enough to cause yeah. um, issues. And you don't know, James, on that, you don't notice that it gets backed up at the front desk at all with that. Mm, I, no. I think I used to do it that way. And, and they, 
my team tweaked it just a tiny bit, but I, that's, that's great. Yeah, every team is going to work yeah. a little bit differently. And that's the point. Yeah. That you got to solve that. Your team has to solve these issues. And if I, a, great I, way, a great way to do it is to gamify it, is to start tracking how much time people are waiting. See if you can get that number down. Gotcha. And when yeah. it gets down to a certain limit, they all get, you know, hundred bucks or something. Yeah. Or you, yeah. give them, you give them a book or you. I, I saw one person in chat that mentioned they eliminated the front desk completely. So they get it all done in the back. Yeah. I've seen that too. Finance there. All the great, great thought. Let's go to the next one. Uh, uh, bottlenecks around your assistant. You can read it here. Uh, but, and, and I'll, Warren, why don't you go first here? How, is this a problem in your practice? Do you have an issue with assistants and not having enough and you're waiting for them rather than them? No, uh, typically no. But lately I had one assistant that had a operation on their leg and they've been, they're, they're an extra assistant on a day where we have multiple dentists. And we, so we were like, oh, we'll be okay without them. But I noticed it the last two weeks that they've been gone. It really is uh, something that's hurt us and been a bottleneck. Um, but yeah, so we, you know, having an assistant uh, for every dentist, some dentists like myself, we need more than one assistant for sure uh, to keep up. And so other things we can assist or use is isolites or dry shields so that you could go and start in another room while your assistant is finishing up a temporary in the room that you were just in with them doing crowns. You know, you can get started alone if necessary. And uh, using auto chart notes makes charting very quick for your assistants. Uh, making sure they're cross trained so they can help in front, they can answer phones, they can, you know, as much cross training as possible. And, uh, you know, those are a handful of the things that we do to eliminate bottlenecks with us. Or let me, let me ask you, I, I think this is a question that probably a lot of people have. Uh, you mentioned use auto chart notes. I know that in my practice, my assistants do a lot of my notes. Now I check them and review them. Is that, is that how you do it? Are your assistants yep. actually writing your chart notes? They do all the chart notes. I don't do any. All I do is review them. Can you imagine the bottleneck that that would be if you were having to write those? <laughs> I know that I don't know what most people do. I've always had my assistants uh, do yeah, that, and I you, always review them. You just need to train them. If you'll take the time to train them, it makes your life so much easier. The, the one on that uh, also that jumps out at me, the bottleneck that I was having in my office was my front desk was always answering the phone, and then they would they would be on the phone, and we'd be trying to check people out. And I said, why, I have this assistant that's just sitting there, she's not busy, she should answer the phone. And so it's, it's a cross training, I feel like, well, I'm an assistant, I'm in the back, I don't, I don't answer phones, and you, you gotta get rid of that mentality. No, we're a team, and when you're available, you get to answer the phone, and you need to learn how to schedule somebody and answer a question, and that, that's an important part there too. Maybe yes, for sure. Great insight there. I think my favorite one on this whole list is the Isolite. If you haven't tried it and haven't used it, it's so simple. Your dentistry is better. You don't have to use the rubber dam and you're getting a better seal. There isn't any, any, any moisture from the breathing either of the patient. You're getting a better uh, filling in place and it, your, your composite's gonna last even better than a rubber dam in my opinion. And I, I just believe so strongly, not only does it uh, allow you for better, better patient care, but it allows you to now have your assistant go be putting in the chart notes or getting an instrument that she might've or he might've forgotten that can sometimes make you frustrated because you have to stop because no one's there suctioning anything. But with the isolite, they can go and do something else. Remember the theory of multiplication and delegation using technology and automation? The isolite is a perfect example of using automation and technology to eliminate a bottleneck. It's not a computer, it's mechanical, but boy, does it solve a problem. Does it replicate an assistant? Doesn't mean I'm gonna fire an assistant. It just means my assistant can go do other things now so we are much more efficient. I have some assistants who say, I am never going to leave your dental practice, Dr. Anderson, because no one else uses an isolite. <laughs> and I love it here. We, we, we use one in every room, every room. So to talk about a morale problem, right? When you have a morale issue, people are turning over. Well, stick an isolite in. It's a bottleneck problem. It's just too hard. You're asking them to do too much. <laughs> That's a good example of, of that theory. Okay, let's go to Seric Crowns. And I know you use a Seric machine. I, ha I haven't invested in one yet in my practices, but, but Brian, you do this and you found a way to make it so it's very efficient. Yeah, that, that's when was one of the uh, complaints about Sarek when, when I converted over. It was the only one of the things that I didn't really like about the Sarek was the possible bottleneck of, of 
monopolizing a chair for 30 minutes while the crown was being made. Uh, I think the research says that about 30% of doctors are using some form of CAD CAM um, in office milling now. So it, it, it is an issue. Um, so we kind of, we've kind of done some things to, to help that. The first thing is delegate everything that can be delegated. Doctors shouldn't be designing the crown. Doctors shouldn't be, even though sometimes it's fun. And, and you know, if you like it, you enjoy it, you do it, obviously do it. But just know how much it's costing you per hour because you know what your opportunity is. Right? Like, right. And some doctors love it. And there, there are times when I will sit and, 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 die and do it. I'm, I'm not perfect that way either. But to be completely efficient, um, they can scan it if legal in your state. I know that's a little bit of a gray area there if they, should, if they can scan it. Um, my assistants do a great job of scanning it. I check it, put the margin on, and then I let them. It was, a, it was really hard for me to let the assistant take that from me because I'm putting a permanent crown in their mouth. I really wanted it perfect. But I found that these assistants can get really good at designing crowns. And they get, they get as good as I do. So, um, and they, they just become a better assistant that way. So you let them, let them do as much as they possibly can. The other problem with the, the Cerex, like I said, they're sitting in your chair while they're being made. So and some doctors are saying, well, I don't want to turn the chair around because it costs me. I have to, I have to cavicite it. I have to clean it. I have to put new stuff out. In my office, I just don't think it's worth having the, the patient stay in that chair. And sometimes if we're slow enough, we'll keep them there. But most of the time, we're turning that chair. As soon as the scan and as soon as it's sent to the, to the mill, we're dis dismissing them and telling them to come back in one hour. So you're not putting a temporary crown on. They're just leaving nope. it still numb. You're yep. saying come back. They'll still be numb. Yeah, they'll still be numb. They just come back in there. We have a Walmart buy, and it's like, if you have anything to go get done at Walmart, if you have an errand to go run, or you can wait in the in the in the waiting room. Um, but most of the time, they'll go and come back. And it, it, it's really important with that because it will monopolize your chairs really quickly if you're not doing something like that. Um, the other thing that you know we all have complaints about and we were kind of joking about is when if you're making a temporary crown assistance we've got to train them to become efficient quick and, and fast with us while we'll walk by an operatory that we felt like we finished the crown about an hour ago and the patient's still sitting there oh. like, what is it? wait what are we doing in here is he still making it temporary that's a one star <laughs> review of waiting to happen right there yeah that's right and so uh that's that's a bottleneck that that happens quite a bit is those temporaries what that means is that the person is an 80% at an 80% level of delegate. I'm making a crown that's 80% as good as yours. And so you have a training issue and you've got to invest in, in on a Saturday, maybe and hire, uh, ask your very best assistant to train those that don't know how to make them yeah. very well. And, and there's ways to do that. We've done that. We've got some models. I, I prepped some crowns and I poured it up and we had new people coming in and we had them practice on. Yeah. on I'm curious. Models. I'm curious. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm the only Sarek user in, on the panel. I'm curious if there's, other ideas out there. If you have them and you're a Sarek user, and even though we move on to the next one, I'd, I'd still be interested to see what you do to, to fix that bottleneck. See, I'm even convinced after putting together this webinar, and thanks for asking for that, I, I want to see those insights. But after putting this together, I actually think, I think it's time to invest in a Sarek. As long Sarek. as the margins are just as good, yeah. you're, you're well, telling me they're just as good. I like them better. I you do. like them better. I like them better. Uh, James, you're, you're, you're going to want to wait till we have our uh, custom ESS pricing. Oh, on right, 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 right. Okay. Yeah. So my, 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 I, I didn't feel this way five years ago, James. I really didn't. I, I, I had one then and I didn't like I But the technology is now, I think, to the point where I like it better than a traditional crown. The, the point is you, I, you, don't want your, you, don't want your you don't want the person sitting in the operatory in unproductive, not being used for an hour um, when you can use it to do a crown or do a filling or do a root canal or see an emergency or whatever. You, you don't want to have someone just sitting there. And that's why it, you're saying, Brian, you figured the best way to do it, the just in time theory of, of inventory management is to have them arrive just in time, just when you need them. Yep. And if they're sitting there, it's like excess capacity. You bought too much of your inventory of your, of your raw goods and you don't need to use it all. And it's just sitting there and that's an opportunity cost. Each, yep. each, each chair costs you money when it's not being utilized like that. But my point is, after creating this webinar, I thought, I thought we should, let's do this poll here in a minute, but we should, I should do the CEREC because one of our bottlenecks is our laboratory weight. We have to bring people back and they come back in and sometimes the crown wasn't ever sent out or we got the wrong patient's crown. I've seen that before. 
And there's, a, there's a inefficiencies there that the CEREC helps eliminate as long as you do everything we just described. You delegate it. You're not the one designing it. You, if you can legally scan, you, now you don't have to do impressions anymore. And you, the person leaves for an hour. You don't have to numb them up again. They don't have to waste a temporary crown. And, the number of efficiencies there you get. And one of the exciting things that we'll have in the future is those manufacturing partners are so interested in designing some educational webinars on the new products that they have. And they would love to, you know, offer education on, on these kind of products and how it's best utilized. Brian, what is this poll all about here? Let's talk about it. Okay, assisted hygiene. This is uh, something that we've, we, I've always practiced. Um, I know that uh, James and Moore have mostly always done it. We, we wanna know uh, how many on our panel use what we call assisted hygiene. What that means is we're double booking our hygienists and we're adding and uh, giving them an assistant. So they're becoming like a provider, like a dentist. We're giving them two rooms and we're giving them an assistant. And the uh, hygienist is not to turn the room over. They don't clean the room. They don't, all they do is they go in and scale clean and educate the patient. And, and maybe a few more smaller items, but the, the assistant does all the other work for them to, to make sure that they're running smoothly and they, they can operate two assistants or two patients in one hour. So the poll question is simply, how many of you run assisted hygiene? Taylor, is there any legal issue about asking this question? Are we gonna be in trouble for asking people if? <laughs> I don't think so. I, I think no, we're okay. Sure. Okay. Well, that's important. We only have 20 people that have applied. Will anyone, anyone that doesn't answer, would they be in trouble legally for not answering? <laughs> well, I, we, this is an important one. Everybody, please just say yes or no. Yeah, whether or not you do it. We, we have 30% of the, of, the, of the folks that are on who voted on this. It's an important one. And I am surprised how many have not. I can see the numbers coming in now. Why don't we go ahead and, and close the poll? Oh, we have more votes coming in here, but let's close it in the next five seconds. Uh, here you are. So many of you are not, over half of you are not doing assisted hygiene. And I'm curious why. You've had some that have mixed results and some that are considering it of 10%. Good. Yeah, it, it put the reasons why down in the chat box and we can continue on because we believe so strongly every practice I have ever built has been built. If we bring in a hygienist, we bring an assistant from day one, 100% of the time. And all of my assistants, that are all hygienists that understand that, they love it. They all love it. They love it. They love it. They love it. They, love it. they, are, they don't get burned out. It's not about all of that. You sometimes will hear that excuse when someone never has done it before. We, we over, overlap like this. So we have 30 minutes here, 30 minutes there, 30 minutes there, 30 minutes there. And the cleanings are, you know, about 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And the other 30 minutes is for the assistant to seat the patient, take the radiographs if needed clean the room, put in the notes, build a relationship, uh, review treatment if anything was already there, wasn't there. There's a number of things that, and even hygiene education can be done by the assistant. The idea is anything you can delegate away from someone that's not as expensive as your most expensive piece of machinery to produce whatever widget you're trying to produce, that's the, the theory behind it, you wanna be able to delegate that away. And you'll never hit a 49% profit mark, uh, overhead ever, 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 if you don't start using assisted hygiene. And it doesn't turn it into a meal, I promise. That might be some of the fear. It doesn't. It's just the opposite. It turns it into a very productive. They get to know more people. Uh, they, they, if someone no-shows, it's not nearly as damaging. It's not a whole hour of your day. It's only 30 minutes. You, uh, you have families can be seen quicker. There's a number of real events. Instead of a four hour appointment for four people for, in a family, it's two hours for four people. And there's a number of real efficiencies here, including a burnout of hygienists. I believe that hygienists are more burnt out when they don't have assistance. They're yeah. cleaning more. How about, why, you know, why, don't, why don't you clean your own instruments? If you're not gonna have an assistant to do hygiene, you see my point, I, I say it tongue in cheek with all respect, but anything you can delegate away, like cleaning your own instruments. I haven't cleaned them since dental school. <laughs> because I can hire someone to do that and I'll help them if they're backed up. So that isn't necessarily true. I have helped in a time of need, but most of the time that's not the bottleneck. Yeah. In the chat, in the chat box, some are mentioning that the, the problem they have is they get too many exams to do it in one hour. And um, there are some things that you can do to get around that as well. 
But that is a problem, right? Uh, Warren yeah. and James, we always sometimes complain, oh man, it's exam after exam after exam. There, there's some things that we've impl implicated to get around that. And one is, is that really a patient, some aren't required to have an exam every six months. So if the hygienist knows we're backed up and we're, we're not going to get to them for a while and uh, she feels like they're clean and look, we'll get you next time on, on the next six month uh, exam. We don't do that very often, but it's, there's some things you can do to, to alleviate those exams. Yeah. But again, you're, you're, you're putting yourself as, as the bottleneck and that's where you want it, right? My, my guess is a lot of people too just don't have the space and that comes in designing the office properly in the very beginning to say, I need to have enough chairs so I can do assistant hygiene. Yeah, that's probably the big one. We always do seven operatories at least. Part of the way we get rid of all the exam problem is that we have two dentists always in the, in the built big enough for two dentists. Each dentist gets two operatories. The hygienists get three. Uh, or four, depending on how many hygienists we have. If we have room for eight operatories, we'll do eight. In one of our practices, we actually expanded after 10 years and added seven more. And most of them are all operatories for a hygiene. And, 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 we're, we, and we had the best month we've ever had last month, ever, at all time, after COVID. Patients love it. They like it. We have a lot more hygienists. We have more doctors now, three at a time instead of two. It doesn't feel like a meal. It doesn't. It's not. We care about relationships. We care about people. We care about high quality work. That's our culture. We care about serving people and meeting their needs. And it's amazing how it works. So that's one way to eliminate so many exams is you have an associate with you. Yep. Uh, but you, you, your team can figure that out. Brian's offered some ideas. I've offered some ideas. It does uh, work. It works. Uh, I'm, I'm getting some stuff on the chat. I, I clarify, we, we don't miss exams very often. And it's only if the patient is a routine patient and doesn't want the exam. We, we, we go over that. Okay. That's very rare. I've had a patient once. Uh, this is, I think, my first year in practicing. I was working for someone at the time, and I insisted on doing the exam. I partly was because I didn't know any better, didn't know you could do that. And I'm not, and, but the patient had been a, pra a patient in the practice for 12 years. She never had a root canal or never had a, a cavity in 12 years. I, I only think in her entire life. And I made her wait for 30 minutes. This is to your point, Brian. I made her wait for 30 minutes. <laughs> when I came in, she was livid. She was so mad at me. And after, you know, two minutes, it was check, 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 and everything was good. And she said, are you going to charge me $45 for that? Hmm. Because yeah. I didn't need it. I, and you made me wait. And she was, <laughs> yeah. Oh, but you bring up a good point. But we're, that's not, we're not saying don't do exams. No, that's, that's we do all our that. examinations. But there's opportunities there yeah. to kind of. Yeah kind of help when you get backed up and, and the bottleneck has to always be you that's the point we're trying to say right right that's right. yeah that's right absolutely yep. all right okay well there's some more ideas there and of course you want to more add, add more hygienists and time warren would you like to quickly review the idea of sure some, some of our doctors don't even use hygienists i know that some of our colleagues don't use hygienists they say they're too expensive right in my mind i'm thinking it's too expensive not to have hygienists i should never yeah. do an srp ever Ever. Bottleneck theory. Remember that. Anything I can delegate away. Plus, hygienists do SRPs better than I do. I had a patient once who told me when I first didn't have a, when I didn't understand this concept and I was a brand new dentist, she left the practice after coming in and then came back six years later. And I said, we didn't see you after your last cleaning. She said, well, you did the cleaning, doctor, and I hated the way you did it. And I was hoping, <laughs> hoping that you were a real dentist and had a hygienist six years later, and you did. So thank you. I love you. I like you. I just didn't like you. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So um, I mentioned before, you know, using this practice that I still practice at $350 the hourly overhead rate. I always kind of mentally say, okay, me as the dentist, I'm going to take care of $250 at least of that hourly overhead rate. The hygiene should take care of $100 of it. And uh, so anything in excess of $100 for the uh, production in the hygiene chair that hour is profit. Anything that I exceed over $250 an hour in my chair is profit. And so if you'll go to the next slide, Sarah. Or James. Okay, so the next, the next thing that we might say is, okay, now it's time to add another hygienist. So if I add another hygienist, well, that my hourly overhead rate might go up to $390 an hour now. And if that's true, then as the, de as the dentist, I still need to cover $250, but now hygiene, needs to cover $140 an hour, but with two hygienists, they only have to cover $70 each an hour to become profitable. So as soon as they both exceed $70 in production, that's all profit. 
And so that kind of helps us see how we're lowering our overhead and increasing our profits. Just don't be the Wendy's operator that puts up a sign and says, go to the next window and do all your work. I'm the dentist. I do everything. I only have one uh, assistant and a hygienist. and I don't have a hygiene assistant. Just remember that. That's what you're doing. And you got to trust that by spending some more money, having a different system, ensuring that it works, by opening the flow, you'll become like Chick-fil-A, uh, except with a focus on people. What I mean is you'll become efficient. And more people will be knocking on your door because they love how efficient you are. As long as your quality is good, your personality is good, you're honest with what you do, the people all around you fit the same culture. But there's a number of factors, but eliminating that bottleneck goes a long way to help improve uh, the demand for your service and your practice. Okay, let's talk about front office. About 20% of you said this is one of your issues. So let's discuss it here. Uh, Warren, any insights? Is this one of your concerns at your office? Front office, bottleneck, receptionist, answering the phone? Yeah, I mean, thankfully I don't feel that in my office is a, a bottleneck, but it's so important. I think we all understand why the front office getting patients in back to the, you know, back to where we're going to actually produce money, that cannot be the slowest part of the practice. You got to get them in the chair, get the treatment done, collect and, and you know, filter patient, as many patients through a day that we possibly can. Brian, you talked about how with, when your front office is a bottleneck and they're not answering the phone, that's one way to tell. If your front office is a bottleneck, you, um, your phone isn't being answered. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what, what the other part of this is that jumps out at me is that front office person in my, I had a, a personal experience with, with my front office. The problem was she didn't want to let go of some of these things like IV. She didn't want it. She wanted to verify every insurance and she did, and she wanted to answer every phone call. She, she had everything all so tight. And I talked with her about it. I said, well, how come, how come we can't delegate that? I, said, I don't really trust anybody else to do it. Mm -hmm. And it comes back to what we said earlier what warren was saying about the doctor he says i want to be able to replace you and and the same thing here I, now i would never replace her i don't want to replace her but i want to make it so that we that's your mentality should be hey I, everybody else is helping so much i'm replaceable and uh, but that is irreplaceable because she's created a team that everybody's helping each other out so that became a real bottleneck because we weren't weren't work, working as a team. She didn't trust other people to do other things. And we really had to break that up. Well, I, I think the idea here is you have a whole front desk staff. You have your front desk, you have your front office staff, you have your person doing yeah. billing usually, you have your person doing hygiene recall, you have your person doing IV verification, you have your person doing treatment plans, then you have someone overseeing, managing, managing the entire staff, ensuring that everyone's getting along and playing nicely with one another, right? No gossip. All that is tough to do. And the, uh, our point is, and you can see some of the chat ideas. I love the fact that we're learning from each other. We all have different ways of solving problems and they're all good ideas. Is that uh, there are different ways to approach this. And some of the ideas we have, you can see listed here, including outsourcing, things that you can delegate. Remember the theory is delegate away anything you can delegate away. Let your front staff be focused on relationships, on people, on ensuring that, that, that connection is being made heart to heart. So they want to keep coming to you. Even if your prices are higher than somebody else and you drop their insurance someday, I'm not saying you do that, but if that were to happen, if they really love everyone in the practice and you really have made a connection and they love the quality of work and they feel comfortable there, people will pay a few bucks more. They will. But if it's just transactional, if they don't care and nothing's done and it's inefficient. So anything you can delegate away, you want to delegate away. And then, of course, aligning pay with results goes a long way. We'll talk about that in our next webinar. Okay. I, love the, I love this in chat. Someone says, phone should never be answered at the front desk. And that, that, that's great. How many times have you walked into a doctor's office or something and the front desk is on the, on the phone with somebody? It, it almost seems a little rude. It's so much nicer when you walk in and on the phone and they can greet you. I, I love the suggestion. Yep. Uh, Some great cool. suggestions. People eliminating the front desk completely and, and – uh, you would need to do a lot of outsourcing or, you know, have something, you know, like that in place to do that. And this is how, this is how ESS was founded. I, we, we, we just had such a huge problem with our billing. We couldn't figure it out. No one was doing what, what ESS does. No one was doing it. And I went, I went and did a Google search. How do we do this? And no one was doing it. And 
Sandy, my office manager, and I talked about it. And we're like, why don't we start our own? And let's just solve our problem. We built it for us, and we solved it. And then, and then we helped others. And uh, and, and most most on this call understand what we do. So it's an important thing. It's an important concept to remember to try to delegate away as much as you possibly can, including even answering the phone. There are different. You know, we don't offer a service like that. There are other people that do. And I know we eAssist uses something called Ruby receptionists uh, to answer our phones initially. And then they patch it through to one of our sales folks or an IT person or an accounting person. It's a way to eliminate a bottleneck, someone not answering the phone. So there's opportunities like that out there. Okay, let's go to scheduling, uh, breaking up this kind of a bottleneck. Uh, the, here's some ideas here. It's important to, to and this, this isn't groundbreaking. Most people do this, but I'm surprised when so many people call ESS, they still are using paper charts and they don't have some of these uh, uh, concepts understood. So if it's review for you, that's wonderful. Um, put your ideas in the chat box to help someone and, and you might learn from someone else too that's in the chat box too if these ideas are not new to you. But having a, having a 10 minute block scheduling like with Dentrix and Open Dental and other, other software programs have you utilize. Uh, uh, we, you want to make sure that it's you, your, your first 10 minutes is for the assistant, uh, for like a crown, for instance, and then or your first block is for your assistant. The next block is for the doctor. Then the final block is for the assistant. So in this scenario, if I'm going to do a crown, I will tell the person while I'm treatment planning, that's a one, three, two. And she knows exactly what that means. And then she'll overlap all the assistants. So the doctor time is never overlapped because I can only be in one chair at one time. But if I'm efficient enough and I'm working well, then I'm always going to be in the right spot at the right time. And the assistant will always be in the right spot at the right time. And I have two assistants, one per chair, because my chairs are overlapped, but I'm not overlapped. And that's how we do it. Using texting tools, of course, to automate your confirming your schedule is important. And Warren, I think uh, you use Google, Google Text for that. Is that yeah, right? we do. We use Google Voice. Google Voice? So Google Voice allows us to text our patients and communicate with them through Google Voice, and it's been fantastic for us. So you don't spend extra money. You don't spend money on Weave and others. You just, you just use that free resource to text and have your staff do it. I do right now, yeah. That's yeah. exactly how yeah. it's been successful. Another important concept is to open up your hours. You've got it. Extended hours are amazing. They really do when you – when you try to do it, Brian, you wrote this down when we were putting these slides yep. together. Explain. Yep. Well, there, I, I, like I said, I've come to a crossroads in my office where I either have to add another operatory. That's an option. But the other option that I have is, well, let's just open up the practice two more hours at night. So we close at five. Well, if I open up the practice, I get six more operatories for two more hours. So you add extended hours to if I go from five, if now if I stay open until seven. Boy, that relieves that bottleneck because it's really important. We, we talk about wanting our, our schedule full and dentists want to feel like, oh, I'm, I'm busy because that makes our practice feel good. But in reality, if we're two weeks scheduled out, that becomes a bottleneck. People can't get in to see us and we don't know how many people call us and say, can I get in for anything? If it's a cleaning or if it's an emergency and they can't get in for two weeks, those patients, sometimes they just disappear and they go somewhere else. So uh, we've got to look at that mentality. And I, I like to look at my next day and see just maybe a hole or two, because I know the next day someone's going to call with a broken tooth and they love it when they come in. I say, you know what? I can do that crown right now. We'll get it done. And boy, you become really efficient that way and you don't lose the patients. Um, so it can become a bottleneck that, that, that schedule being tight, so tight that you can't get anybody in. Well, so we, one of those hours. What we did is we were we were so booked out. We booked out a you know two weeks, three weeks, month, and we and we were already extended hours from seven in the morning to seven at night. And we were and the way we got people to do those extra hours is we just paid an extra two dollars an hour for the staff members to be on those hours. Sometimes change requires that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but if new someone new is coming in, they expected to work from seven to one or one to seven yeah. or whatever. You don't have to worry about that. And they were open Saturdays from seven until one or two. And I think, Brian, you hated that when you were my yeah. associate because you were missing BYU football. That's right. So, oh, I hated Saturdays. You, you got out of there as fast as you could. <laughs> so you could have your Saturdays. But what we did is we opened up a second location, and I was worried that it was going to be too close, but it wasn't. It was five miles away, and it became a home run because 20% of our patients left. Yes, they left our practice and went over to the new practice, and, 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 but only 20%. 
And sometimes now, even to this day, if they're offended by someone in one of the practices, instead of leaving a bad review for us and going somewhere else, they go to the other dental practice because they like who we are. I was amazed. So five miles away is another good way to open up your schedule. If you're completely booked out, you got to build another practice. As long as you've already done your extended hours, this will help you. Yeah. Um, you'd be surprised. Got- I, I mentioned this point here, Warren, I'll say this in a second, but I mentioned this point here that at the beginning of this call, I said that I had a dental practice that was struggling that we just opened and we were only open two days a week. And I kept saying, we got to be open five and a half. Let's go, let's go. And the, and the, and the doctor was always, well, we're not busy enough for that. No, 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 no. The, remember the story, Field the Dreams? It's the <laughs> entrepreneur's like story. If you build it, they will come. If you open it up, they will come. I promise. Yeah. Capitalism works. Yeah. Warren? Yeah. Oh, I was just saying, we, I've built them two miles apart from each other, and they're both producing tremendous money. And so even two miles is not too, too close. Mm-hmm. Well, we have about 10 more minutes, Warren. Do you want to skip over the slide or you want to summarize this? You know, I think we'll just let people read it uh, as they review it. It's pretty, it makes pretty common sense. Okay. Now, here's something that we run into. Do you have nitrous in every operatory? You got to. You've got to be able to perform any procedure in any operatory. Set it up that way. Uh, You got to make sure that you've got radiograph equipment in every operatory or use a Nomad hand machine and have enough of them so that it's never a bottleneck. Now that Nomads are are uh, you know, approved and, and safe and a, an option. We also use specialized carts. So any operatory can be an endo operatory. Any operatory can be a restorative operatory. We just move the cart from one place to another. We have enough carts for every, we have two endo carts for a doctor who might be in two separate rooms. If we have two doctors and we have four rooms, we'll have four endo carts. And we store those in each of the rooms. And we can just pull them out and put them in the right room, get them all sterilized, all clean, ready to go. So any operatory can be any can do any procedure. Warren, you do something similar, but you use like trays or carts? Or- yeah, we use trays. So we have our tub, you know, oh. that we can bring in for that. Um, I do have, and I probably am guilty of this as a bottle deck. I do have my preferred rooms that I like to do implants in. So, um, I, you know, I, I could expand and do better at that if I could do implants in any, in any operatory. Yeah, I like that a lot. And another, another important thing too is, is having photographs of tray setups uh, in your drawers, so people know what's supposed to go where. It's just a basic lean manufacturing system. You want you want photographs and imaging and graph graphics to help in the time of the world when they're trying to set up the, the tray properly, that they know exactly what's supposed to go where. Uh, it's an important con. If that is one of your bottlenecks, then those are some ideas. Any other ideas, please drop it in the chat box. Okay, what about radiographs? This is a bottleneck sometimes. I'm surprised that people are still not using digital radiographs. You gotta use those, that's simple. Having enough sensors, enough phosphoric plates. I sometimes like having the phosphoric plates rather than sensors because of my workflow. I will wanna get up and do an examination. Uh, And it's a perfect excuse for me because I wanna always be the bottleneck is to have the person take an x-ray and I'm leaving the operatory and because I'm not using a sensor, they can't see that it's automatically there. And I'm going to go do an examination. I'm the bottleneck, not the radiograph. And the patient isn't upset when they have to wait a few minutes, five minutes to to have me take the x-ray because they don't realize that it's automatically done like in 10 seconds, like the sensor would. If I were to leave an operatory and go to examination and we go in and do an x-ray and the sensor's done, they can see the radiograph is done. They're wondering, why are you still waiting? Why am I waiting for the doctor? Isn't my time as valuable as him, as his? And so at least that's part of my thinking. It hasn't, the theory hasn't been proven, but it seems to work well. And we have a bunch of good reviews, happy people. It's great for the workflow. Uh, you can read it there. Any other comments you want to add to this, Brian or Ward? No, I think it's great. No, yep. Most people didn't have that problem. But we did have a sterilization issue as a bottleneck. And the number one problem, I think, is we don't have two sterilizers. You yep. can't have your sterilizer be your bottleneck. <laughs> <laughs> we had we had one time our our sterilizer go down and it was embarrassing but we couldn't slow up we i had to call my endodontic friend that is a, across the street a little bit and i said can we come over and use your autoclave for the day uh, boy that'll shut you down if you if you if you have anything go down that way yeah i've had the oral surgeon that shares the building with me had that same problem theirs went down they brought all their stuff over to our side of the building and sterilized it all we always have two you got to be prepared we have two sometimes we even have three uh, the big tanks that can close in that are inexpensive and then a statum 5,000 that we can do a bunch of quick stuff for 
but I, when I was a young dentist, I just bought a Statum 2000 thinking that's all I needed. And when it went down, I was mad at, at the, the person who sold it to me, not realizing that this is just like the cost of doing business. You have to maintain stuff. Things break. A lot of pressure there. A lot of heat. Uh, so don't be afraid to skimp here. Buy extra stuff uh, and then create a photograph of all your tray setups so it's hanging there and anyone can see it. Uh, it's, a, it's a great way. Any other ideas, guys, about helping eliminate sterilization bottlenecks? We, this is not a problem in my practice. Is it a it problem? Used to be a, it used to be a problem in my practice. It's not anymore, but it's because I added, I just, simple as that, I just added a second huh. statum and that problem just completely went away. Right. Remember, you're the most, if you know your dollar per hour opportunity cost, we let off with this conversation. You know it costs you 400 bucks, 500 bucks. Some of you are 600 bucks an hour not to be doing stuff. The statum is 3,000 bucks, three and a half. You're going to pay for it yeah. in one day. So go get it. Spend the extra money and you'll be surprised how happy everybody is. Okay. Busting up equipment and technology bottlenecks. Let's talk about this. Any comments, Brian, Warren? Yeah, I mean, you know, de definitely there are great pieces of equipment that actually will help you produce more money per hour. And I think we'll get a chance next webinar to explain spend money to make money, uh, what some of those pieces of equipment are. Yeah. Well, this is a big one. I mean, again, the computers, right? How many, I would imagine there's at least some out there because this happened to me. Your computer goes down, you're done for the day. And that's an opportunity cost that kills you, right? So, James, I don't even remember this. I, you had to come down and, and help me with some computers at one time. I had to shut down the whole day, and that is I know. Huge. That cost so you I swore on my raft uh, that I would never have that happen again. So we put in some definite, some, some fail safes. I have a backup computer uh -huh. that's always running, and I can, I can just switch it if, if anything goes down. Um, internet, same thing. Some people have, uh, they can run internet off their cell phones if they have to. I know we purchased a, a little device from uh, Verizon that will, that will broadcast it and it will broadcast it through, through the yeah. offices. Uh, so yeah. always have these backup plans because boy, if it goes down, it, it'll cost you as much as a new server in that, just in that day's worth of production. Just in that one right. we, we have that same thing, Brian, the little wireless uh, thing from Verizon where we can make it a, a wireless uh, network if we need oh, to. Yeah. Um, one experience I did have with this, I'll just share real quick, uh, is when I had two providers, we both placed implants, but only had one implant motor. And they would always be like, oh, you can't come in then because oh, I know Dr. Wallace is doing an implant. <laughs> so <laughs> we bad. have to put you on a different day. That's why, that's why your staff have to understand this principle. And if you align their incentives, and we'll talk about bonus systems next time, then magic's going to start to happen where you're not the only one that cares about these things because they all get it. It's fundamental. So we even had a, we even had a vacuum, uh, a vacuum go out before I had my bulldog. Remember that Brian? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it went out and we had to close the whole day or two days. And that was 6,000, $12,000. You're never going to get a 49% overhead if you're shutting down a day for and losing 5k. Like yeah. you're just not. These yeah. things, you might think, well, I, I'm going to save money by not having a backup system. All they're saying is have a, have a separate vacuum system on hand. Yeah, it can be an expensive one, but have a separate computer on hand so you can quickly throw it in and you just lose one patient, and which is a dollar per hour instead of 10. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it, you've got to be prepared. All right. It's important. I, and I love the ideas coming in. Please keep sharing, helping people if this is a bottleneck. Now, 10% of you said that patients are your bottlenecks. Of course, the idea behind it is we got to help prevent patient cancellations. That's a big part of it. But there's other things too. One of the things that we do is we confirm, of course, hygiene, hygiene recare appointments two weeks in advance. And then again, two days in advance. Sometimes people get annoyed by that. But not if we're texting. It's not as bad as when we used to do phone calls. But still, tongue in cheek, if someone set an appointment up six months ago, and that's, we also do that. We encourage them to set the appointment up six months ago in the operatory before they leave so they're not lost. If someone does that, um, we don't call an appointment. We call it a reservation. We made a reservation for you six months in advance. We want to confirm that, make it, your, make, it, make it your appointment, make sure it's still good for you. Please call the office, reply back to this text, whatever. It seems to work wonders for us. Uh, what other ideas do you have about busting up patient bottlenecks? Warren, Brian? Go ahead, Brian. Well, I mean, very last one there is kind of tough. And, and I know that this is all over the board. I'm sure everybody has a different protocol. But the big thing is, is to train your patients 
to be on time. Um, we, we like to be as generous with patients as possible, but they also, we also want to train them, hey, we're expecting you to be here at a certain time. And some of that is, is that we're on time too, uh, so that they don't get in the habit of, well, they're, they're always running behind anyway, so I might as well show up late. Right. There is a little bit of a training of your of your patient pool to be on time. Maybe you put in some protocols that that uh, that do that, but um, right. it's a big one. Yeah, we've we've bought like a cheap uh, you know TV from Walmart. Like it looks nice, but it's like two hundred bucks, right? Yeah. And we have a raffle. If you're on time for your appointment, you get to put a a little thing in. And oh, wow, yeah, you might win the TV. That's a creative solution to busting up this bottleneck and and because I, one, I think one of the things to remember is you want to start if it's a problem and we don't have solutions here for you today for this and you already are doing all these things that we have listed here and, and your colleagues aren't adding anything new that you don't have if it's a problem for you and your practice remember the idea of measuring kpis I mean, remember the idea of, of of trying to find a way to get automation of some kind and part of what you're doing here but are you measuring how long patients are waiting for their appointments? Are you measuring how long patients are in the chairs? I think when you start to measure some things and, and figure out what those KPIs are associated with patients and their bottlenecks, you'll start to find solutions when you start to drive better numbers. Uh, and and, and they're, they're, maybe you'll make a new tool that you could give to someone else to help another colleague solve the same problem. Like that's the kind of creative thinking we got to do here to solve these problems. And I wish we had more answers here. This is just the obvious, but. Um, we don't, it's not necessarily a problem in my practice. Our patients, our patients come, they're on time. We hardly any no shows. We, whenever we've taught, taken Medicaid, we've had a huge problem with, with patient bottlenecks. No shows, people not coming, people being late. I say that in all kindness, but for some reason there's some connection there. Uh, but I, we don't have this issue, so I don't know what else to say. Warren, Brian, any other feedback? Yeah, what, one thing I'm seeing in, in Jack that's, that's actually a really uh, – good question and it's a it's a good thought on bottlenecks is not is how do i make treatment plans with the patients with insurances and we didn't really talk about this much but it fits in here because um what we do in our office what, what you need to do is you first of all you you've got to eliminate that bottleneck by getting that insurance information before they even come in uh, so that it's lined up ready to go um, that's that's one way uh, another another way that I've eliminated it in an emergency situation is that we put it in and we have to call the insurance and we don't have their information. Well, sometimes we have to call the patient later that day and, and give them the information over the phone. It's not it's not ideal, but um, yeah, those are that's a, that's a bottleneck is the insurance, right? Trying to get the insurance plan and, and in there. Well, and finally, we're about to end the presentation. Finally, the most important thing. As a dentist, you should always be the bottleneck. That's the takeaway we want you to want you to absolutely have from today. And only 14% of you were, were doing that. And maybe more of you understood that, but aren't practicing it yet. We hope you find a way to solve all your bottlenecks so that you, the dentist, is always the bottleneck. Remember, by always delegating anything you possibly can away that's legal in your state, you want to do that. If I lived in Washington, I would not be putting fillings in. I wouldn't. And I wouldn't feel badly about it. I ensure that my hygienist did a good job and I train them, I get them right, and I have them be putting fillings in because they can. You wanna make sure you hire the right people that have the right attitude and skill. Of course, that's simple. But again, aligning a pay with results so it's a win-win all around will do wonders for you. And then of course, adding partners. We're gonna talk more about this in our next webinar, how to bring in the right associate, how to pay the right associate, how to add different, different strategies for adding different associates and there's different ways of doing it. We all, all tried different ones different type of bonus compensation structures to help align pay with results so that you can even expand and eliminate the dental bottleneck, still being the bottleneck, but making it even better. But the idea that if you focus on these 12 areas, you know what they are, dive in deep, figure out, ask your team, bring them all together, what are our bottlenecks, like what we did with you? And then just focus on one a month. Don't tackle too much all at once, just try to solve one of them. Once you get it done and you standardize the workflow, you can go to the next one. So then in the end, you're the one, you're the dentist is the one that the bottleneck. If you do that, you're well on your way of accomplishing your margins of 49% uh, or overhead of 49%. You're, you're well on your way. It's, it's powerful. The more revenue you bring in and the happier people, people are, the, the, even though you're spending a little bit more, you're making more money too. You're spending money to make it. All right. Any other comments about that, Warren, Brian, before we wrap it up? Oh, I think, I think you nailed it. 
I recommend you read another book called The Toyota Way if you're more interested and in, in want to learn more about efficiencies and operations, Six Sigma, lean management, some of the concepts of bottleneck that we've discussed here. We hope that you've learned these ideas, that, you, that we've opened up your eyes to the idea of efficiencies and bottlenecks. And every time you go get a fast food something, we, you remember this webinar. <laughs> and you focus on your 12 operational bottlenecks around dental offices and you figure them out so you can cross them all off and saying, that's not a bottleneck, that's not a bottleneck, I am the bottleneck. We hope that you've learned from each other, you see the power of synergy, a lot of good ideas all around. We, we have our own experiences and we're experts in our way and so are you. And so is your front office staff. And so is your assistants. And so are your hygienists. They know more than you do in many areas that pertain to their responsibility. So tap into that power and see what kind of magic you can create. We want you to focus on mind your margins. We hope you come and, and join our next, our next webinar. We hope that you put a plan in place to overcome these things and uh, become uh, a, a dentist that has an overhead of 49%. All right. We don't have much more time for questions, but let's do it. Uh, you're welcome to leave. Those of you that want to stay on, we'll stay on for the next 15 minutes. Uh, we appreciate all those that have been who stayed with us for the entire webinar. Most of you did. We hope that you find it beneficial. Uh, let's take 15 minutes with questions, and uh, then we'll uh, meet again. I think it's next month. Sarah, what do we got? All right, so we do have a few questions that have come in. One of them is from Miguel. He was asking at the beginning of the webinar about um, how you calculate overhead, and do you include the associate salary in the overhead calculations? Yeah, and I did uh, see that, and I answered. Um, Yes, you don't count, count that as overhead. That's dentist income in the sense of what we're talking about, hourly overhead rate. So any money you pay a dentist is dentist income. Awesome. Great. Awesome. Well, Miguel, you let us and, know. And I, I do want to say, sorry about that, Sarah, to interrupt you. I do want to say, go back and watch that webinar number one. We, we made that pretty clear, and we spent about 20 minutes on explaining that. And I think once you do that, if you have any more questions, you can email us. What's the email address that they use to ask, ask, uh, ask, any, ask us any questions, Sarah? You can email webinar at eassist.me. And I also dropped the recording link on our YouTube page into the chat at the beginning of the webinar, as well as a link to the slides from the first webinar. So you can also watch both of those from there. Okay, great. Thank you. Awesome. Great. Uh, we do have a couple other questions that have come in from the chat. Um, one is from Z Shen. He was asking specifically about intra-office communication. Do you guys have any systems that you recommend for that? Dental office QB. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there is one that uh, we just started at one of our practices called Blue Note. It is an inter-office communication system. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we're old school right now. We just, we have cards that we just put next to uh, they're all laminated, and whenever someone needs a doctor in operatory one, two, or three, the hygiene assistant will go and put the little card next to the doctor's uh, in the operatory against the x-ray machine, it's the magnet there that sticks, and we know where we need to go. Uh, it's not, it's not uh, efficient. Uh, it's not as efficient as it could be, uh, but we're uh, you know, a highly profitable practice. Uh, good question. Brian, you talked about dental office QB. What was your idea? Well, well it, it's a great question. It, it just poses a question that all three of us have already had. And, and we, because we feel like there isn't anything out there that's really good. And we, we are developing a, uh, something we call dental office QB and it answered, it deals with just what you asked about. So it, it's, it is a problem that we're all wanting to get a little better because I, we all hate it when we have that assistant that's sitting behind us and they're waiting on us and they're just, you just can feel them behind there going, we need you, we need you, and we all, it just, it gets ner unnerving to all of us. So uh, it's, it's a great question. Hopefully, uh, hopefully in the near future, we'll have a product for you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in the meantime, Blue, you said, uh, we used to- Blue Note. Blue Note, Blue Note's one. Yeah. We even used a, something called, um, it was a, it was actually a piece of hardware that we, that was designed yeah, remember for that. offices. Remember that? And you could push yeah. it and it would so, say- was, you know, it, was it a walkie-talkie? <laughs> kind of like that, but they stopped making it. Chorus code. I know I've seen headsets before, and I, then there's some good comments that it works well in offices. I haven't. I don't. I don't. I don't. I, I struggle wearing a headset like that, so I haven't chosen to do that. But those are options. I know when you're. 
when you're playing a game like Age of Empires or something, you wear a headset to communicate with your teammates. So it works, it works in a dental office. I, I, uh, I think another, um, you know, there is some like just basic, basic texting systems that uh, communicate. It's, it's, but you got the solutions you want it to be private so the doctor sees it only and, and like even the idea that dr borg is talking about we're using an apple watch so it communicates that way and it's very calm there was there was something that was released once before but it didn't go very well it, they don't think they support it anymore but yeah it, it went away uh, okay what's next sir all right well we did have someone ask about the hipaa compliancy of google voice after warren made that suggestion taylor do you want to speak to that real quick yeah, a great question. Um, just a, a couple of quick thoughts on that. Remember that there's different uh, products provided even uh, by Google, different levels. And so absolutely, always make sure that the particular product um, you know, you're using, of course, there's the Google Suite versus just Google's free version, right? Right, and, right. That's what yeah. you have to get. Yeah. So make sure you, uh, and, and I always tell people, go straight to the vendor and ask them to confirm that it's HIPAA compliant. And they should have you sign a HIPAA business associate agreement and so forth. And uh, but it's the right thing to be thinking about. Again, there's uh, you can also always be careful, uh, well, or uh, you know, reduce what you're communicating such that it's not PHI. But if that doesn't make sense for what you want to use it for, absolutely make sure that what you're using is HIPAA compliant. I'll make this announcement now, but our, our plan is to release a, a software application so that uh, all of our ESS customers will have a texting tool that's HIPAA compliant that integrates into your software. I got, we don't know when that's going to be released. It's it's on the docket here, but it'll be coming down. And uh, it's, it's something as simple as that. That's all we need yeah. to ensure that we're working well and everything's great and it's all interacting perfectly and it's easy to use. It's real simple. Yeah. All right. Another question we had come in from a few people is asking specifically about incoming call handling, um, outsourcing to a call center. Who can who can they um, you know outsource to to help get that handled? Um, so that they don't have that clogging up the bottleneck at their front desk. Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we're beta testing something right now. That's all we can say. I don't know if anyone else that does it. I, I mentioned Ruby. Ruby doesn't really do anything for uh, in, uh, in for dental offices. And the, but there might be some other solutions out there. And people in the text box may have some ideas. Do you have any they, ideas? For, they for, could. They, they could do. I mean it's really easy to forward your phone calls to, to somebody off site that you just know it's just a one person. I know we've done that in the past. Yeah. Um, you have to be able to access your computers to schedule and things. So you can set up your own off, but, but yeah, we're, we'd love to get a, a service out there that does that. We, you know, I've used grasshopper before, whenever I've started a brand new office, I've always used grasshopper and it's a, I think it's owned by Citrix. Now you hear it advertised on Fox news. Uh, as a uh, radio, Fox radio, I think I've heard it before, the entrepreneur's phone system. It allows you to ring a phone number and it can go to any other phone and phones that you have so that you can find a way to, if the phone, if that phone number is your office phone number, it can ring to other people's cell phones that are working from home, people that you've hired, people that have connections, like you could figure out your own and jerry rig your own system. Uh, I, I wish there was a, there were some more viable solutions out there. Maybe there are. Uh, we for sure we're gonna we're gonna help there. It's just a matter of time for us to to get there. But great question. I think that was it. That was the last question we had come in through the chat. So I think we are good and all caught up. All right. All right. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Uh, we'll see you next time. Our next webinar is August twenty eighth, three p.m. one p.m. Mountain, part three of Mind Your Margins. Thanks, right. Thank you everybody. Bye. Bye. See you. <laughs>